Open your Bibles to the first chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I want to speak with you this morning about the topic of inheritance. I want to talk to you about inheritance. Inheritance is important in every civilization. Every civilization has some kind of rules and traditions with regard to inheritance. Because inheritance is the means by which one generation provides for the next. So it's fundamental to a civilization, the whole concept of inheritance. The Proverbs in the 13th chapter in the 22nd verse says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And I think one of the blessings and challenges of being a grandparent is to think about how to creatively implement the truth of that proverb that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I believe it goes far beyond simply providing materially beyond the next generation. Although I don't think it's less than that. But I do think it's more than that. I think about spiritually, leaving a spiritual inheritance. In other words, what kind of an impression am I leaving upon future generations? When they look at me, do they see more than just a Sunday morning Christian? A certain set of behaviors and certain vocabulary that's reserved for my Sunday life. But the rest of the week, does it look different? Do I speak about grace but fail to extend grace and mercy to others? What kind of a spiritual inheritance am I leaving to subsequent generations? I think the proverb speaks also relationally. Relationally, in, in other words, how do I get involved and how do I stay involved with subsequent generations? The older I get, the easier I realize it is to wall myself off from other generations, younger generations. But if I do that, then how in the world am I to leave an inheritance and so we need to be creative in thinking about these kinds of things. What about when distance separates in case of, of actual familial relationships? What do you do when the grandchildren are no longer close at hand or perhaps on the other side of the country or the other side of the world? How do you stay involved relationally with that? Or, or maybe your life circumstances are such that you don't have grandchildren. Maybe the Lord has not blessed you with that. But still, how do, how do you as a, as a believer in Christ think about being relationally involved with other generations, leaving some kind of an inheritance, some kind of a legacy that stretches beyond yourself? It's often said that the that Christianity is like a relay race in which the baton has to smoothly be passed from one generation to another. Or said another way, Christianity is always only one generation away from extinction. And so how do we pass on that inheritance? And then certainly materially, how do I go about making decisions now such that I don't consume everything that the Lord has entrusted to me. 
And so that there actually is something to leave to my children's children. These are significant and important questions to be sure, but they're not the main point of what we're talking about, but it, but it gets our mind thinking about inheritance and how significant it is. Because Paul here in this passage is writing about inheritance. We're picking it up here in verse 11 to the end of the, well, to the end of verse 14. And Paul speaks about inheritance and he says that God the Father has given his children an inheritance. And this inheritance is immense and, and beautiful. And it captures our, our affections, or should. And as the Spirit uses the, this glorious section here, I, I pray that in this week and the week to follow as we tease this all out, that, that our hearts will really be drawn to Christ to think about this. So I was meditating this week on, on this passage and or to think about how to prepare it in terms of preaching, a structure and a title and, and all of those things that are helpful, I think, to, to sort of understand what's going on and to maintain a, you know, kind of a grasp on it as it goes. I thought about jewels, an inheritance that, that consists of jewels that, that just glisten, that are, that are just unimaginably valuable. I remember some years ago, we had the opportunity to visit London and there to, to go to the Tower of London where you can see the crown jewels of the British Empire. They usher you in there through these massive, thick steel doors and you, you stand on this moving sidewalk, as it were, and, and you just are processed by the jewels and they're, they're behind thick you know, likely, I imagine, bulletproof glass. You don't linger long. But as you go by and you, and you just see the, the fabulous jewels that have been accumulated over a millennium, the British Empire, diamonds big as your fist, rubies and gold and crowns and just all of it. And it is just amazing. And that's an inheritance, as it were, of the British monarchy, and yeah, even the British people. But the inheritance that we have in Christ makes all of that look like paste, clay. So I've entitled our message this morning, The Seven Jewels of Our Inheritance. The Seven Jewels of Our Inheritance. Seven jewels that display the beauty and the wonder of our divine inheritance. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to give you all seven of them as we begin, and then I'll read the passage to you, and as we go, you can see how these jewels are drawn out by the Apostle Paul in this passage here. So here they are, the seven jewels of our inheritance. First, our inheritance is the shared right of the firstborn. Secondly, our inheritance rests upon the Father's initiative. Third, our inheritance reflects the Father's meticulous planning and control. Fourth, our inheritance is claimed by believing the gospel. Fifth, our inheritance places us in a multi-ethnic family. Sixth, our inheritance is guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. And seventh, our inheritance maximizes the Father's glory. Let's read. Paul writes, beginning here in verse 11, the first chapter of Ephesians. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, 
to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Let's take a look at that first jewel. Our inheritance is the shared right of the firstborn. Paul says, in him also we have obtained an inheritance. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Now the concept of inheritance is significant to the scriptures. It it appears all over both the Old and the New Testament. And it refers to the blessing of God that that comes to those who are his children. Those who bless, that that he blesses, and those who follow him. The passage we read earlier this morning in Psalm 37, there is a repeated refrain in there that, that those who are faithful will inherit the land. And that concept is, is common in the Old Testament. The land of Canaan is, is frequently spoken of as Israel's inheritance, that which God will give to his people. In the Sermon on the Mount, in the fifth chapter, in the fifth verse of Matthew's gospel, Jesus says that the gentle, that is the humble, will inherit the earth. In the 19th chapter, in the 29th verse of Matthew's gospel, Jesus promises his disciples who who make great sacrifice to follow him will inherit eternal life. 25th chapter, in the 34th verse, Jesus is talking there about the righteous Gentiles who live through the tribulation. He he calls them the sheep, and he says they will inherit the kingdom of God. Conversely, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9 that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50, Paul says that flesh and blood cannot inherit God's imperishable kingdom. That is, those who are not perfected in glorified bodies. And in Revelation 21 and verse 7, Jesus says that he who overcomes will inherit these things, a reference to the new heavens and the new earth, and I will be his God and he will be my son. All through the scriptures, there is a consistent theme that The people of God will inherit a kingdom. They will inherit a kingdom. In the Old Testament, that kingdom was very closely tied to the land of Canaan and to the Davidic throne. We move over into the New Testament, and and Jesus speaks about a coming kingdom, and, and it's a reference to that same Old Testament kingdom. To which he says that that we who who follow him will will be able to enter in someday into that physical kingdom that is entered through a spiritual door. And so the idea of the kingdom or sometimes called eternal life and inheriting such things, it's common knowledge to us. But at the same time, I think for many, it's, it's still vague. If you ask people to, to, to define what, what is your inheritance in Christ that Paul talks about, what is that? And that's when the eyes glaze over a bit and people say, well, you know. So let's tease this out a bit, huh? Let's try to tease this out a bit. Notice here in verse 5, Paul writes here that that in love he, that is the Father, predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. In other words, before the foundation of the earth, God the Father predestined certain individuals to be adopted as his children, to put them in union with Christ. 
And this, this plan of God, this determinate plan of God that, that he put into place before the foundation of the world activates, if I can say it this way, in space and time, in the moment when someone turns from their sin to Jesus Christ and throws themselves upon his mercy, believing that Christ died and rose again for them. At that point, we become children of God, children of God. We are brought into a new status, a new relationship. We, we are now in this new family, and the new family is God's family. He becomes our father. And this is brought about as a result of our union with him. And being part of the family, Paul says, we, we have now obtained an inheritance. Look again, verse 11, in him... Also, we have obtained an inheritance. In other words, in union with Christ, we are now part of God's family, and we share the family inheritance. Over in the eighth chapter of Romans, Paul speaks about the same concept. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 16. Listen to what he says here. He says in verse 16, Romans 8, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. We have an inheritance. Now, this inheritance is not small, and it's not skimpy. In fact, over in verse 18 of Ephesians 1, Paul refers to this inheritance as the riches of his glory. The riches of God's glory is our inheritance. Now, I think as we talk about this inheritance that we have in him, that is in union with Christ, I, I think the, the best way to, to sort of get at this is to, is to consider the, the reality that in a union with Christ, we are sharing Christ's inheritance. And so what is his inheritance? And this is where it gets interesting. Jesus' inheritance is that right of the firstborn. It is the double portion. The Old Testament uses that kind of language. Deuteronomy 21 and verse 17, it speaks about the double portion that belongs to the firstborn, the right of the firstborn. What does that mean? What is the double portion? Well, we could say it this way, very simply. If a father in the Old Testament times had, had four sons, he would divide his estate into five parts. 20% to each part, and then the firstborn son would gain two shares or 40% of the estate. Because it was in him that the family name would continue. It was the father's strength, the scripture says, the right of the firstborn to a double portion of the estate. Now, that concept of of the right of the firstborn is, is later used throughout the Old Testament in a number of contexts, but, but it essentially speaks about abundance. It, it, it carries the concept of abundance. The, the double portion is an abundant portion. And in fact, we see in, in 2 Kings 2.9, I won't turn you, but you can just think through this. In 2 Kings 2.9, Elisha says to Elijah, you know, Elijah says, and what would you like from me? And Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit. Do you remember that? Double portion of your spirit. That is, I want, I want an abundance of, of the spirit that, that is upon you that I might carry on your ministry. Abundance. So we are, here we have Christ. He is the Father's only begotten Son, right? He's the firstborn of all creation, Paul says in, in Colossians 1, verse 15. 
Therefore, he has the right of the firstborn. He has the double portion. And this is where it gets really cool, I think, is because in union with him, we share what is his. That means for you and me this morning who are, who are children of God in union with Jesus Christ, we too share the right of the firstborn, the double portion. Jesus shares his inheritance with you, with you. Well, what does that all mean? Well, here are some examples. Presently, although we are united to Christ in his death, and thus sin is no longer master over us, that's Paul's argument in Romans chapter 6, the reality of the matter is, is that you and I still experience the lingering effects of sin, don't we? One author, Michael Reeves, in a book that I would highly commend to you called Rejoicing in Christ, reflecting on this reality of the, of the continuing, lingering effect of sin in the life of the believer, he says the following, and I quote, chafing, cramping, leeching our joy and freedom. Sin steals, death bereaves, our bodies hurt, evil oppresses. That is how it is today. Yet in that day we will be freed at last from the very presence of sin, death, and evil. We will finally share his own glorification. What is Christ's inheritance? Part of his inheritance is his glorified body, raised from the grave. This, then, is a portion of our inheritance in union with him. In other words, our broken bodies will be made entirely new. Perfect, glorious, powerful, imperishable. What an incredible message for those who are sick, huh? For those who are handicapped. For those suffering with chronic pain, what is your riches of inheritance in Christ? Well, a part of it is the reality that the, the sin that is constantly dogging you will not go on forever. It will not go on forever. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power he has even to subject all things to himself. In union with Christ, you're going to get a body like his. And i got to tell you, the older I get, the more I think Come quickly, Lord Jesus, huh? But it's more than that. Presently, we live in a world that bears the scars of sin, don't we? We live in a world in which thorns and thistles infest the ground. We live in a world in which the animal kingdom lives under the blood-led red law of, of claw and fang. But it's not always going to be that way. It's not always going to be that way. When Christ returns to set up his kingdom, the very creation itself, Paul tells us in Romans 8, will be liberated from its bondage to sin and decay, and, and we will inherit a beautiful world of peace and prosperity and harmony. The first man was given the task of ruling over the creation, managing its productivity for God. But ever since Adam fell from his lofty post, creation has been waiting for another who will not fail. Christ is the second Adam, beloved. He is the second Adam, and, and he will not fail. And, and so in union with him, we will share his stewardship over the creation. 
Tomorrow is Monday morning. Monday morning means back to work. And back to work means head-on-head confrontation with a world that just doesn't work like it ought. Someday, someday, the second Adam will steward this creation and in doing so will, will draw out all of its productivity. And in union with him, we will share that stewardship. But it gets even better than that. It gets even better than that because Jesus is superior to Adam, yes? And in fact, because he is superior to Adam, his reign must be greater than Adam's. In other words, when Adam was in stewardship over the creation at the end of the the sixth day, right? God looked on what he has made in Genesis 1 and verse 31. He says it is Behold, it is very good. But Adam was only a creature and not a true son. He was fallible. He had a natural body. He was susceptible to temptation. And we know what happened. But in Christ, we are adopted sons. Someday we share in Christ's glorious and imperishable body, according to Romans 15. A body perfectly situated and suited to live in God's presence forever. A place in which there are no longer the threat of sin and only the tree of life. Revelation 22. How far and away that exceeds Eden, huh? We're not looking to go back to Eden. We're looking to go beyond Eden. Beyond Eden. And that is a portion of our inheritance. The Apostle John writes that when Christ returns, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. We will be like him. Beloved, That is the double portion of our inheritance from God the Father. And that is the first jewel. Secondly, second jewel. Our inheritance rests upon the Father's initiative. In him, Paul says, also we have attained an inheritance having been predestined. Having been predestined. Predestined. Same word that's used there in verse 5 of the same chapter. The word means to determine beforehand, to to mark out beforehand, to, to determine something. So Paul, what is he saying here? He is clearly stating that the initiative in our receiving an inheritance rests with God and not with us. And how appropriate that is. Beloved, if if it depended on us, just think with me about it. If it depended on us, we would never leave our sin. Never. We would never leave our sin and believe the gospel. We love our sin too much. Too much. We may hate some of the consequences that come temporally. And we don't believe the ones that come eternally unless and until the Spirit of God works on our heart in regeneration. So it was up to me, it was up to you. You'd never leave your sin. The initiative has to lie with God. The natural man is blind to the devastating consequences of their sin. They're passionately in love with their own delusion of autonomy. And free will. The scripture tells us the natural man cannot see the things of the Spirit of God. They do not desire the beauties of Christ. And how much less they long to share the inheritance of Christ. But here's why it's a jewel. 
While we were dead in our transgressions and trespasses, right? God, being rich in mercy, graciously reached out to us. By the work of his spirit, he he opened our eyes. He, He caused us to be born again. We were regenerated such that we could see the beauty of Christ and the and the ugliness of sin, and we were enabled to turn from sin and passionately flee to the cross of Christ. In fact, Paul says just that in the next chapter in verse 5. Where he says, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. While we were dead, he made us alive. Now, I've done a bunch of funerals in my life, and there's one thing I can tell you for sure. That dead people are dead. In other words, dead people don't believe. They don't sit up and talk to you. They're just dead. Speaking of the same wonderful truth over in Titus chapter 3. Paul writes there in verse 5. The Father saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. In other words, he saved us not because of anything we've ever done that would incline him towards us, nor anything we ever will do that will incline him towards us. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit Words of Jesus in the third chapter of John's Gospel to Nicodemus. You must be born again, or you will never even see the kingdom of heaven. That is not a command to be obeyed. That is a statement of reality. Unless you have been born from above, unless you have been regenerated by the washing work of the Spirit of God, you will never see the kingdom of God. Never. The initiative of our inheritance lies with the Father. The glory of all of this is, of course, that it points everything to him, right? There's nothing for me to take credit for. There's nothing for me to boast in. There's nothing for me to feel superior to the next person in. It reduces me to to the same level playing field at the foot of the cross where everyone must come. It would be kind of like the world's richest man uh, leaving you $100 billion. If that were to happen, you can imagine the news reports, right? So-and-so who has lived in obscurity their entire life, has just inherited $100 billion. The news article would not focus on you, I can assure you. It would all be about the generosity of the, of the multi-gazillionaire who left you the $100 billion. That's where the focus would be. Because that's where the focus belongs, in the giver of the gift. Our inheritance is a shared right of the firstborn, a second jewel. Our inheritance rests upon the Father's initiative and closely tied to this third. Our inheritance reflects the Father's meticulous planning and control. It reflects his particular or his meticulous planning and control. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. Now, the Father's initiative in all of this, by the way, is in providing an inheritance to us. It's not a haphazard thing. He's not capricious about it. In fact, 
Paul strongly emphasizes here that, that the Father is not responding to any events in all of this, but instead he has a carefully designed plan that he is revealing and that he is fulfilling, particularly as it relates to, to choosing and redeeming his people. I mean, look with me. Notice the use of the words here, the word purpose, right? Having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Purpose, work, counsel, will, all of these terms together, they, they communicate the Father's deliberate, intelligent decision that issues forth in his will. In other words, he accomplishes his purpose through the outworking in space and time, a plan that encompasses all things. It encompasses all things. You see it? He, he works all things after the counsel of his will. Notice the all things, by the way, back up in verse 10, right? The summing up of all things in Christ. In other words, the Father's plan here encompasses everything in the creation. There is not a stray molecule in all of creation that does not work out the Father's predetermined plan. Everything is brought together. Well, beloved, in this, there is tremendous comfort. Tremendous comfort if you, if you just begin to think about the implications of what Paul is saying here because what he is saying is that you would not believe in Christ this morning. If you, if you are here this morning and you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you would not be where you are now if it had not been for all of the events and circumstances of your life leading up to this moment. Everything. All comes together. So that your eyes would open according to the timing and plan and purpose of God to see Christ in his beauty and to place your saving faith in him. This, this includes all of the painful experiences of life. It's all pulled together here. All of life's frustrations, all of life's unforeseen and, and unwelcome interruptions to your plan. Even being the recipient of other people's evil, it is all brought together by God in his plan to accomplish his purpose of bringing you to faith in the family of God. I mean, Paul says as much in Romans 8, 28, right? All things, there I see it again, all things work together for good. That doesn't mean all things are good. Indeed, they're not. Much of what we experience is not good. But God is so great. He is so powerful. He is so wise. He, 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 all of this, he overwhelms and subdues in order to accomplish his purpose and plan for my life and yours. little autobiographical illustration here. In college, I was an atheist. I wanted nothing to do with God. I was on a mission to disprove his existence and relished the opportunity to engage with anyone who was so foolish to say that he did exist. I was also headed for a career in the Marine Corps at the time and wanted nothing more in my life than to be a Marine officer. In my own arrogance and pride, I shook my fist in the face of the one who I said didn't exist, which in and of itself proves the logical inconsistency of atheism, but that's for another day. And by the way, I'm not alone in that, right? All atheists fall into that same trap. But I defied him to prove his existence to me by striking me down. Praise God, he didn't take me literally. But a few months later, through a 
sports accident. I was hit in the face with a baseball traveling at a high rate of speed and partially blinded in my left eye, which I remain so to this day. Well, the Marine Corps didn't want officers that are half blind. And so that ended my career. And over the next year, as I wandered and meandered aimlessly, trying to find a new anchor and purpose for my life, God introduced me to some true Christian people who began to share the gospel with me. And through that experience, I came to see and understand and know that God was, that sin was real, that he had sent his son to die in the place of sinners, and that he rose again conquering sin and death. And that if I would turn from my sin in arrogance and embrace him, that he would save me. And he did. And he did. And so the guy who, as a young, arrogant college student, wanted to show the world God didn't exist, finds himself 40 years later standing before you and proclaiming that he does. And that he saves sinners because he saved me. Beloved, there is no circumstance of your life that's wasted. Maybe you're in a really hard place right now. Maybe it just seems like there's just all this stuff going on. It is not wasted. God is at work. He is, he is working out his plan. And his, his plan doesn't terminate at the moment of our salvation. It continues on. There's just such tremendous encouragement in in the 50th chapter of, of Genesis, right? Genesis 50, that's, a, that's the account with Joseph and, and his brothers. You remember that? Where his brothers, they sell him into slavery. They want to kill him, but they don't have the courage. So they decide to let others do it. They sell him off into slavery, so he'll get on to Egypt and, and basically be worked to death. They fabricate a lie for their father, the whole thing. You remember it. Then later when they, they come down and Joseph reveals himself to them and he, he provides for them and so forth, and then his father dies, Jacob dies, and the brothers are worried. <laughs> They're worried that now is come in payback time, right? Joseph's now the second most powerful man in the, in the nation of, of Egypt, which makes him the second most powerful man in the ancient world. And so they, they say to him, hey, you know what? Dad, before he died, he said, uh, you know, you got to let it go, man. I mean, that's an you know, idiomatic translation. And Joseph says this to them. He says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Listen, that's exactly how God works. As he is working out what, what Paul says here, his purpose who is working all things after the counsel of his will. In other words, his providential rule over his creation, which is, encompasses every single aspect, every molecule. Much of it is intended for evil. But God intends it for good. I mean, think with me. How many, how many separate decisions, how many how many seemingly random occurrences, how many painful, hateful, murderous intentions did God overwhelm to bring Joseph to the place of the second most powerful man in the world? I mean, a few of them are sketched out for us in the account, aren't they? All that God might deliver this small family of Jacob through whom the line of the Messiah comes. Why is that story there? Why does Moses include all of that? He includes all of that so that we might take comfort in it. So that we might be firmly rooted in the reality that the God who does that is the God who will do what he needs to do in my life and yours to bring us exactly where we need to be at the exact moment we need to be there. 
you're sitting here this morning and you don't know the Christ, you are here by divine appointment. Christ is, is available to you now. If you will turn from your sin and believe that he died in your place and that he drank the, the the cup of the wrath of the, of the Father against your sin to its final and last drop. That he has broken the back of sin now and for all eternity. And how do I know that? Because he has ra he's been raised from the dead. He now lives forevermore. And he would say to you, today is the day of salvation. Come to Christ. But maybe you've come to Christ. But you're sitting here this morning and you're in pain. Maybe it's physical pain. Maybe, maybe your body is really not cooperating. I know for some who are, who are experiencing chronic pain, it is, it is so grueling. It is so debilitating. It is so discouraging. It just grinds you down. But it's not random. God is working. Some of you have lost loved ones. Some more recently, others it's been a time, but the, but the whole is not gone, I know that. Even in your pain, God is still at work. He loves you. And he is working for your best, even in that. My friends, these are just a few of the jewels of the inheritance we have in Christ. As we think this week on these, maybe take them out and look at them again. May the Spirit of God encourage your heart. Let's pray. Father, to just think that we have an inheritance with Christ. Staggering. We were once your enemies, now your children, adopted children. Meaning you, you reached out and chose us. You, you selected us. And you love us. And you don't withhold any good thing from us. You, you share all that your son has with us in union with him. Father, it's so easy to, to look at our own lives and to look around. And, and we don't certainly look like kids of the king right now. But Father, give us eyes of faith this week to see what you're doing and to believe what you're doing as you accomplish your great purposes in and through us. Let us go forth from this place encouraged in that reality and eager to speak to others that they might also become your children. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.